I'm going to start out this afternoon by telling you about a church. And it's not a church here in Appleton. It's not even a church from this decade, so you don't have to try to guess which church I'm talking about. But it, it was a real church. And it was a very, very popular church. It was so well known, in fact, that there were people in the city and maybe even in the cities around it who, who even if they didn't actually go to the church or like attend the church or be affiliated with the church in any way, they knew it. And they celebrated it. They praised this church for getting involved in the community and all the amazing things it did. And it did a lot of amazing things. It was active. It had a dynamic and charismatic pastor. People went to this church and they left just feeling good about themselves. It was a very, very lively church. But it was also dead. Here's what Jesus says specifically about this church in Revelation chapter 3. To the angel of the church in Sardis, and that's his way of addressing the pastor of that church. He calls him the angel. So he's speaking to the church's pastor. Right. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That's Jesus. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. I want to focus just on that phrase that Jesus uses to describe this church. You have a reputation of being alive but you are, say it with me, dead. dead, all right? If you were church shopping and you Googled churches in Appleton and the first church that popped up had a zero star rating, can you do a zero star rating on Google? No, one star. We'll give it a one star. A one star rating and the comment below it simply said, dead. Would you visit that church? Probably not, right? It's really hard to put a good spin on that. But the thing about this church is there was really only one bad review because all the other reviews about this church said amazing things, right? Great programs, good for the kids, good music, good pastor, all this stuff. So maybe as you're sorting through these reviews, you'd be able to find this one bad one and you would just kind of like dismiss it as the outlier, right? Maybe this is the guy who spilled the coffee on his pants on the way into church or his kids are giving him a time and he just fires off in his frustration a bad review in his car and he doesn't even go to the church, right? So you just dismiss it. Just someone angry. But then you look at who wrote this review. Oh, that's Jesus. And, um, and, and you know it's probably not a good idea to dismiss what Jesus says, right? Him being like omniscient and everything. So we kind of come to a place where we have to make sense of this. If Jesus says one thing about this church in Sardis and everybody else says something different, then what's going on here? And I think 1 Samuel chapter 16 has a verse that really helps us understand. It says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So outwardly, this church in Sardis, they're rocking. They have people coming. They're doing amazing programs, great things outwardly. But the heart, under it, there's nothing. They look busy, but you know how busyness works, right? Just because a person is busy doesn't mean they're actually doing anything. And in fact, sometimes we make ourselves busy to hide the fact that we're not doing anything. It makes us feel good about ourselves. It makes us look important. It makes us look valuable. I want to illustrate this with a clip from the 1999 hit movie Office Space. This better looks like a Peter Gibbons. Uh-huh. Oh, there you are. What we're just talking about you. You must be Peter Gibbons. Uh-huh. Terrific. I'm Bob Slidell. This is my associate, Bob Porter. Uh, hi, Bob. Bob, why don't you go ahead and grab a seat and join us for a minute or two. You see, what we're actually trying to do here is we're just, we're trying to get a feel for how people spend their day at work. So if you would, would you walk us through a typical day for you? Yeah. Great. Well, 
I generally come in at least 15 minutes late. Uh, I use the side door. That way Lumberg can't see me. <laughs> and uh, after that, I just sort of space out for about an hour. Tell him uh, space out? Yeah. I just stare at my desk. But it looks like I'm working. I do that for uh, probably another hour after lunch, too. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. All right, so the church in Sardis busy doing stuff, but as far as actual work goes, not much. And you look at the things that they were doing, right? None of the things that this church in Sardis was doing were actually bad. I mean, they had a good reputation. They were involved in the community. They had programs and stuff. Those are great things about a church. I mean, I hope, I hope that you think those things about Bethany. But they never brought these things in for a landing. Jesus says, I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. These amazing things, programs in a church, things that a church does, a reputation of a church. Think of these like, like uh, bridges. Okay, bridges, maybe a bridge is a beautiful thing and you can admire that bridge and, and celebrate it for what it is. But more than that, bridges have a purpose, right? They're not meant to simply be looked at. They're meant to be used. And the purpose of a bridge is to get across something, to bring someone from one point to another point. The church in Sardis, it had a lot of bridges. It had a lot of things that it was doing that was good. But it stopped short because the place where these bridges are supposed to lead is bringing someone to the truth of Jesus, that Jesus is our Savior who washes our sins away and who gives us heaven. But when these churches, when this church in Sardis stopped short of that, then they never brought the sin for landing. They had this bridge there, but they never crossed it, right? They were, they were a, a bridge museum. Now, I'd like to think that if God came here to our church, to Bethany, he would see our bridges. And we do have a lot of bridges here at Bethany, right? We have a lot of things we're signing up people for right now. We have Bible studies. We have small group Bible studies. We have our big drive for Equip Week where we're getting people to sign up to staff our worship services, to work in the tech booth, or staff our ushering crews. We have things we're doing in the community. We had our, our National Night Out event about a month ago where we had a lot of our community at our other campus come together. We have our Fall Festival coming up in about a month over here. On Tuesday, we're going to be inviting like 70 kids and their families to the first day of 4K here at our Shepherd. All these things are bridges. But if we never use the bridge, if we never use these opportunities to lead someone across the bridge to see Jesus, then we're stopping short. So my encouragement for you is if you are someone who serves on a team at Bethany, or if you're someone who's a member here at Bethany even, and you're proud of your church here at Bethany, see what you can do as an individual to help people cross these bridges. A program in and of itself isn't going to bring someone to Jesus, right? But these are bridges that Jesus sets up for us to lead other people across them to see Jesus. And how about on a personal level, right? Because God's given you bridges in your life too. Our opportunities that we have, the resources that we have, these are all things that God gives us as ways to introduce people to Jesus. If God was following you around for a week and kind of just like taking notes on everything that you were doing, would he see you using these bridges to lead people to Jesus? Or would he see you using them to, to build our own kingdom? Now here's the thing, that's really not a hypothetical question, right? Because like we said earlier, Jesus is omniscient and everything, so he does, he does see us. And he knows us. He sees our church. He sees you as an individual. And he sees past all the externals. He sees past the busyness. He sees past the titles. And he sees, he sees the heart. And I think if we're honest, we'd have to say that even on our best days, where we are celebrating God's kingdom and leading people to him, even on our best days, there's always going to be a part of us that's always looking inwardly. That's looking at me that's living to build my kingdom. And what does Jesus say about that? Dead. If, if dead is a bad review for a church, for an individual, it's even worse. 
Dead for an individual means that we are cut off from God, cut off from life, cut off from, from heaven. But you know, Jesus says this, not to make us feel bad, not to shame us. He says this because he loves us. That's why he comes to the church in Sardis in the first place, to love them, to help them see what's waiting for the end of their spiritual apathy, to call them to wake up so that they can open their eyes and see their Savior, so that they can see all the blessings that God has in store for us. So when we hear Jesus say to us, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, remember what you've received and heard, hold it fast, repent. Don't take this as condemnation from Jesus. Or don't let yourself get defensive when you hear Jesus calling you out like this. Instead, see this as encouragement. As Jesus coming to you because he loves you. Encouraging you to see the life that he gives you. And here's the really cool thing too. The fact that we're all sitting here right now. And it doesn't matter what brought you here today. But the fact that we're all sitting here right now means that we are already following Jesus' encouragement. We are right now holding to what we've received and heard. We're gathering together around the gospel message of Jesus. Proof that there's life. Right? Some of you, you've done that for your whole lives. Like little Brooks here. God's given him that gospel message right now. And even though he can't say with his mouth, Jesus loves me, he knows it in his heart. Because God has given him that conviction through faith. And God's going to keep him in that for his whole life. Maybe some of you didn't come to this message until later on in life, right? Maybe, maybe through a friend or a teacher or a spouse and someone finally brought you to confront the message that Jesus loves you. Maybe for some of you, the first time your, your eyes are really opening up to the truth of that, to what it means that Jesus forgives my sins is right now. But you have it. The message that Jesus loves me that message wakes us up to see the life that God has for us in heaven. And that message, it keeps us strong here on earth every single day. Strong against all the crazy things that life throws against us. Maybe for you right now, that's some big decisions that are weighing over you. And you've tried to find advice for these decisions, but you feel like you're bearing them all by yourself. And they're just peppered with so much uncertainty and there's a healthy dose of fear just swimming through all of that. What a good thing that with all this uncertainty and these decisions, we can come back and know the simple truth. Yeah, but Jesus loves me. Maybe for you, the thing that's coming against you is like failure. You've just had a rough week and failure has just been smacking you like a two by four. Whether that's stuff at work or in your relationships when things haven't been going the way you wanted them to do. Maybe it's your health. What a good thing to be able to come back and to know that Jesus loves me and he's keeping me safe. Maybe the thing that's coming against you right now is the fact that you've felt far from God for a while. And you look back at the direction that you know God is supposed to be and you see a lot of distance there. And it's a distance that's filled with a lot of guilt, maybe even guilt for there being distance with God. And you're not totally sure how to navigate that and get back to him. And you're not even sure if you did, if he would want you back. And the whole time the devil's just dripping these lies into your ears and into your heart, telling you, you know, you've lived this far without God. You don't need him. You're fine on your own. He wouldn't want you anyways. What a good thing to be able to know not, not how to make amends for the past, not how to swim back to God and, and show him how worthy we are, but what a good thing to know simply that Jesus loves me. Because in the end, that's all that matters. Sin and guilt can't keep us away from God because Jesus has forgiven that because he loves us. Fear it can't black out God and make us feel we're alone because Jesus has committed himself to protect us and provide for us because he loves us. And the enemies that attack us, our guilt, the devil, they can't threaten us because Jesus has already defeated them and his resurrection is proof of that because he loves us. Jesus 
has overcome. The battles that you fight, this battle of faith that you fight, it isn't a battle against the devil. It isn't a battle to try to sin less. Those battles have already been won by your Savior Jesus. The fight that we fight is simply a fight to open our eyes, to wake up and to know what God says about us. And listen to what he says about us. This is the last couple of verses of this text. He says, to the same church in Sardis that he just called out, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. These are people whom God has woken up. These are people whom God has given faith. These are people like you. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You. You, person who sins, who struggles with guilt, who doubts, who sometimes can get pretty far from God, who sometimes can make some dumb decisions, you are worthy. You are righteous. You are holy. And not because you figured out how to stop sinning. Not because you have done something so great and pious that you have just impressed the socks off of God but because God has made a choice to love you and because he's made a choice to give you the gospel message that wakes your eyes up to see your Savior. That same message that you hold that wakes you up to see life, that's a message that gives you purpose too because now that you have that message in your heart, you have the ability to share it with others and to wake them up too, to come to them and to find them wherever they are and to build a bridge to help them see their need and help them meet that need. And whether that's listening to them or taking them out for coffee, maybe that's buying them groceries or a tank of gas, we build a bridge, we meet that need, and then as we're walking across that bridge, we start to take inventory of some of the bigger problems in life, bigger than financial, bigger than health, problems like sin and guilt and and mortality. And as we're walking across that bridge and we're exploring the depth of some of these scary problems, we take them by the hand and we lead them to the one who makes it all better. We lead them to Jesus. Friends in Jesus. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up and to see how much Jesus loves you. It's time to wake up and to see how much Jesus loves everyone. And if you're at a place right now where you are standing at the foot of the bridge and you haven't crossed over it yet, you haven't let yourself recognize what an amazing gift of grace is God's forgiveness for you. It's time, it's time to let the Holy Spirit lead you across that bridge. It's time to see your Savior. And it's time to love the people who are close to you. Not to just love them in words, but to take their hands and to take them with you across that bridge that you can lead them to that gospel message of Jesus. Wake up. Jesus loves you. Amen.